we had, I believe it was one of Fuse Universal's highest engagement rates of any customer on the platform. We had an engagement rate of over 640%. Collaboration with people who are out there, boots on the ground, feet in the trenches doing it. So that was the biggest thing. The reason people were coming back to the platform so often was because a lot of the content was from them. The biggest challenge that we actually faced was probably about a year or so out. We realized we had amassed so much content in the platform. So we tried to consolidate as much as possible. So rather than having a ton of content, we had less content that was more impactful. Hello, hello, and welcome, our dear listeners, to my podcast, Love People Technology Learning. And I'm your energetic host, Tamara Kacharova, CEO of Lane AI. And I'm so excited to release a new episode. And today, my guest is Rene Laudermilk. Rene has been the chief learning officer at veterinary innovative partners for over a year and a half. Before that, she spent more than eight years leading learning and development in various industries and actually started her career in the fitness industry. Um, we'll be diving into that today as well, because I know Rene has even contributed to writing a book in the fitness field. And so Rene, welcome to the Love People Technology Learning Podcast. And I'm confident that today's conversation Session will be both fascinating and insightful, drawing from your experience, achievements, um, and the result you and your team deliver every day. Welcome to our show, Rene. How is it going? <laughs> it's going great. Thank you so much for having me, Tamara. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be here and happy to connect with your listeners. So again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come on your show. Yes, thank you so much. And you know, in my podcast, like uh, Love People Technology Learning podcast is about uh, learning and development industry. And at the same time, it's about personality. Uh, it's about from unique guests. And today, like I all, like, not just today, I always start each episode uh, with a guest by exploring their career journey. And I'd love for you to share your story, how you've grown, how you've developed and why you choose like this particular path. Um, and could you share some of your insights uh, or observation for those who are entering the learning and development uh, field today? Where should they begin and how should they go about building their careers? Yes, share please with us. Uh, yeah, um, thank you. I, you know, I, I struggle sometimes to know where to start on my career journey because at, at my age, it feels like I've lived numerous lives so far. So um, I started in learning and development within the fitness field. So I guess I'll start there. That was kind of like my second career um, mm -hmm. was, was fitness. I started in fitness, uh, I think I was 25 at the time. Um, it was right after the recession. And um, I had been working in finance during the recession. Mm -hmm. um, and that was not the place to be. Um, so kind of just lost everything that I had worked for at that time and needed a place to uh, start over again. And um, I got really, really involved in health and fitness because it was sort of a way that I could work through uh, a lot of what was going on in my personal life of, of having gotten to a certain place and lost it all during the recession. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of frustration and, and just things that I needed to work through and fitness gave me that outlet. And I just, I ended up loving it so much. I remember one day I was working out on the floor and the general manager came up to me and asked if I'd ever thought about being a personal trainer before. Mm -hmm. And I said, actually, I was about two weeks away from replying to become a personal trainer because I just, I, I love this so much and um, became a personal trainer did really well. It, this was even still during the recession. I did really well. And I think that's something that happens when you find your passion, you don't have to work as hard towards it because it just comes naturally. And when you love what you're doing, you want to do it all the time. 
Mm-hmm. And that naturally led to a management position where I was managing fitness teams. And what brought me into learning and development is when you're a personal trainer, you're not earning a lot of money. So you have to build your own business. You have to build Mm -hmm. your own book of clientele. And at the time, minimum wage was $7 and 25 cents. And I would have maybe about 10 to 15, what we called floor hours a week that I was able to give to new personal trainers getting started. So imagine 10 hours of $7 and 25 cents a week. That's not paying the bills. And so I ran into the situation where as a fitness manager, I'm only successful if my team is successful. And I have personal trainers who, if they're not making good money after 30 days, they have no other choice, but to leave and find another job because they have to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. So I had to get really good at onboarding and training them to uh, essentially run really great training sessions Mm -hmm. that were both fun and beneficial in terms of what the client's goals were. And they also had to sell. So they had to sell training packages that were sometimes $60 a session, not cheap. Um, I got a process down and got a program down and the company started noticing that I was keeping trainers longer and my trainers were more successful. And that was what brought me into um, the training realm. And so they noticed it. We had conversations. I ended up becoming a regional instructional facilitator where I actually ran our, our the company's certification program, how we certified new trainers. Then from there, I worked my way into an instructional designer. And right about that time, uh, Gold's Gym came in and the company I was working for was a 23 location regional mm-hmm. chain uh, in the Southeast. They acquired us. And they had nobody in the learning and development department at the time. And so they actually had me interview for that. I got it. And that's what actually brought me out here to Dallas, Texas, where I am today is that's where the the headquarters was. So that was, that was how I got started. It was, it's probably a little bit different from how most Mm -hmm. people get started in learning and development. But I think that for me, it's been really insightful because I've always tried to maintain that understanding of what it's like to work in an entry level position of a Mm -hmm. company. And so I, one of the most important things that I always keep at heart is no matter what industry I'm in, no matter what company I'm working for, the people I'm serving or the, are the people on the front lines. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to understand what their reality is to get it right. So often those of us in learning and development and our little ivory towers can be very disconnected from the people we're helping to train, develop and grow. And so that's something that, that I think has been really important and has stuck with me. And I think for anybody trying to get into the learning and development field, I think the number one um, advice that I would give is to never lose sight of the people that they're helping um, to train, learn, and grow. And if you can get your your feet into, um, you know, the trenches with them, be it just mm-hmm. once a month, maybe it's once every couple of months, spend some time with the people who you're designing training for to see what their reality is. You're going to find out so much that you never would have known that just gets lost in translation from our subject matter experts. That's going to make your, your, your training that much more impactful, uh, to the, to the people that it serves. Yes. Thank you for sharing. And, you know, you talked about your career journey and I have a question about what's you really like continue love and have a passion like from your first day in this field and right now and you save it what you really love in your in your work and your job maybe like you know sometimes i'm thinking that's for me my job is my lifestyle it's not something like like something which i really work and that's it no it's my Mm -hmm. lifestyle maybe something you have in your work and you save it Yeah, I think, um, so like, you know, 
what for me is it, it, it is that that really stand out rewarding part of, of what we do for me it's those aha moments it's it's and i think we we hear that a lot across our industry absolutely like anytime <laughs> i talk about creating the aha moments or anytime i've interviewed somebody for my team i know i'm talking to the right person if they if they bring that up that that just ability to move people forward that ability to connect people closer to what their potential is there's nothing better than that. I live for that. It's it's who we are, right? As learning and development professionals, we, at the root of what we do, we nurture others mm-hmm. and we help bring out their potential. So I think for me, that's it. And it's like, it, it doesn't matter if I'm working or I'm, you know, hanging out with my daughter or I like, I'm always going to find a way to try to do that. It's just, it's just who I am. And it's just, you know, as learning and development professionals, those of you guys listening in right now, you're probably really aligned with that and thinking, oh my gosh, yeah, that's me too. I, I, I just really love to help people grow. Yes. I love it too. It's, it's the same for me. And, uh, uh, like I'm in the learning and development industry. I think I've been like over 20 years and like it's it's the same for me and i love it like now i'm in uh, technology and learning and i'm an entrepreneur in this field but like you know learning and development it's my heart it's my soul and it's continued to be with me and like i love this too yes it's it's absolutely the same yeah and now i want to talk to you about like you know you've been in the learning and development um industry across uh, various sectors for over like 10 years 15 years like and today i'd like to discuss a project that stands out for you uh something you're like truly proud um of and both personally and with your team and i'd love um for you to share this project with our listeners um from different like perspectives so that if they are like if our listeners planning to implement a like similar project they can think oh like that sounds interesting and with these tools or steps we could achieve a really effective outcome please share maybe some successful project like that and we'll dive into it together yeah um for me i i I think the the one thing that stands out to me um is uh maybe you know the implementate the lms implementation that i did at, at hearing life when i was at, at hearing life um so to provide a little background and context for for my entire career I, i've been what i i like to call a, a builder um mm-hmm. so you know when i came over to gold's gym there was nobody in the learning and development i department i had to build that up from scratch uh, same thing at Hearing Life. Um, Hearing Life was when I got there. I think a little less than 500 um, locations across 40 states, and there was no learning and development department. So it's this pretty big, geographically dispersed company, mm-hmm. and I was I was brought in to to build that infrastructure. When I left, we were over 700 clinics throughout 42 states, um, with a really solid uh, learning and development department. A lot of which what uh, really rested on our LMS platform that we built called Decibel. We called it Decibel. It was built with on a platform called Fuse Universal, which mm-hmm. is actually a, a Danish um, LMS platform. It was really helpful because you, all these different geographically dispersed locations, you had to figure out a way to asynchronously train people Mm -hmm. and give them access to important at the time of need resources. So, you know, starting from nothing uh, to the time that I left, we had, I believe it was one of Fuse Universal's highest engagement rates of any customer on the platform. We had Mm -hmm. an engagement rate of over 640% which basically meant that we had people who weren't just logging in once a day. They were Mm -hmm. logging in over and over and over again. And that's because it meant that what we had on the platform was so critical to them being able to do their job that they couldn't do their job as well without it. And, Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that, that for me is, is probably the best project, um, 
And even better than that, um, the team that I built, I decided it was time for me to move on from hearing life. After I came back from maternity leave, from having my, mm-hmm. my, my daughter, I came back and I was bored because I had taught my team how to function without me. And when I came back, I realized I'd worked myself out of my job and it would have been a disservice to the company and even to, to, to the growth potential of the other leaders I created on my team if I had stayed in place. And so that was when I made the transition to veterinary innovative partners, Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to build the learning and development department there. So I think, you know, it, it started with a learning management platform uh, in terms of a successful project, but the things that I look back on the most fondly are the team members who I've been able to bring on to, to a team mentor and grow to replace me. So yeah. that's, uh, I think a really, really notable, um, experience too, that doesn't necessarily count as a project, but it always stands yes. out to me. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's, it's the big, like, I think it's really great goal for the leader. If your team can like, can do everything without you and you build great team uh which can grow without you you are the best leader <laughs> like you know sometimes it's like something happens with us like something like that and like what do you think what were the key factors that contributed to it like its success like mm-hmm. yeah which collaboration helps collaboration with people who are out there boots on the ground feet in the trenches doing it. So that was the biggest thing. The reason people were coming back to the platform so often was because Mm -hmm. a lot of the content was from them. They served as our subject matter experts. We didn't have someone in the corporate support office who was our subject matter expert who used to work in the field one, two, three, four, five years ago. Um, So Hearing Life is an audiology company that um, Mm -hmm. sells hearing aids. They do hearing tests and sell hearing aids to the general market. And so our people who were boots on the ground were our patient care coordinators who are, you know, essentially the person who's greeting you when you come in for a hearing test um, and our audiologists, the people who are doing the hearing tests, fitting the hearing aids, doing all of those things. And so we had committees that we created of patient care coordinators who were the best of the best out there doing it. And then the same with our audiologists. And they were the ones who informed what content we had, what the best Mm -hmm. practices were, and not only helped us make everything, but validated that the training that we made um, really, really hit the mark. Yes. And you mentioned about subject matter expert. It's really important when you implement something in learning and development. Of course, when you work with the business, like you need to have uh, the connection with the subject matter expert. Maybe like you, you can share what do you think, like how we are in learning and development need to work with some subject matter expert for collaboration? Because like, you know, I know a lot of stories when like subject matter expert are not so open for <laughs> collaboration. It's really like, because you know, it's yeah. it's the deal, but not the deal because learning and development, it's it's like, it's, it's, it's a department who support business, yeah. But sometimes it's like separate. It's not business. Yeah. Like, yes. And what do you think about it? What what we need to do in learning and development to support subject matter expert and like to do something for, for make them more collaborative? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I, in the past, I've been in situations where we had assigned subject matter experts and there were challenges in working with them, like you said, you know, oh, I'm busy with other stuff, or they had internalized so much of what they needed to share that they weren't really sharing information to the degree that a novice learner would need. There were certain things that they just took for granted or took for understood that really weren't understood. Um, so, you know, when I progressed, I, I, I think what I found was that Um, We needed more leeway to be able to select our subject matter experts. We needed our operations partners to make recommendations 
But for us to go and talk to the different folks um, to make sure that it was the right fit. And what I found is a really good fit are the people who are doing the job, but also have a lot of interest in learning and development. They also have a passion for training and developing others, and they want to be involved in learning and development some way. They're a lot more forthcoming and they're a lot easier to um, upskill in the way of understanding instructional design and how you have to start with things that they may feel are, um, you know, obvious or understood mm-hmm. about their role. But, you know, we have to spell everything out because we can't take for granted that somebody coming in understands something that we think that they should understand. So I think having a, a you know, a larger option pool and really focusing not just on the person who has all the information, mm-hmm. but the people who are still actively doing it, who are passionate about training and mentoring others in their field. Those are always uh, the mm-hmm. best people to work with. They will make the time mm-hmm. and they will think deeper about the the information that they have locked away in their brain and how best to bring it across to other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got it. And you know, Dana, you mentioned the result of your project, like some Uh, percent of engagement like something like that but like how did you measure and evaluate the impact of uh, implementing a learning management system in your business yeah so the the learning management system engagement uh, measurement in particular was actually done within the platform they have a really Mm -hmm. great analytics engine it was actually a measure of not just the amount of logins the amount of of time somebody is 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 um, taking a course. So are they taking mm-hmm. a course? Are they sharing content? Are they viewing content? Mm-hmm. Are they liking content? So not just are they in the platform, but are they in the platform and are they interacting with things? Um, are they commenting on content? Because that was another great thing about Fuse Universal. It was a social collaborative learning platform design. And so it wasn't one of these, you know, kind of, ancient compliance systems that, that, that we've all worked in, you know, before um, it was actually created around the 70, 2010 model. And so the people who designed it weren't software designers first, they were learning professionals first who worked with software designers. So it had a really great um, interface to it that encouraged that engagement mm-hmm. that helped us with that as well. But, but that was how that in particular was measured. We had a lot of different ROI measurements that um, we did as well in training that was outside of the platform. We still did live training. We did virtual live um, training as well. Uh, but in, in particular, as far as how we measured engagement, that was how it was measured. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh... Like, what were the biggest challenges you faced uh, when you, uh, like, implement this uh, LMS and how did you overcome them, maybe by yourself or maybe with your team or something else? The biggest challenge that we actually faced was probably about a year or so out. We realized we had amassed so much content in the platform that um we, we were without coming... without ai <laughs> without yeah. chat without GPT or yeah. like something like which will help you <laughs> sift through it all exactly yeah that this was before you know um ai the way that we have it as as a huge help um to, to narrow things down for us in today's world um but we we were a company who who grew through acquisition and so we would get a new acquisition of let's just say 40 or 150 clinic locations. And Mm -hmm. those locations would have never had access to anything like this. And during the acquisition integration, we're we're bringing their new team members in. We couldn't just introduce them to the full platform because the feedback was, this is so overwhelming. There's so much stuff. I don't even know where to start or what to look at. That was our biggest learning. And so what we had to do is we had to to regularly audit our stuff to say, okay, like these three resources are really the same thing. And Mm -hmm. we just need to consolidate this and take these uh, the others out. These we don't need anymore. 
Um, and so we try to consolidate as much as possible. So rather than having a ton of content, we had less content that was more impactful. The nature of the business, I will say, was really complex as well because we dealt in insurance and managed care. And anyone listening to this who has ever been in an industry that deals with insurance and managed care knows that there, there's mm-hmm. no simple when it comes to insurance and managed care. Um, and I, you know, I think by the time I left, that was the one challenge was across all these different geographic regions with all these different insurance plans, carriers and managed care programs. How can we make this as easy as possible Mm -hmm. for our people in the field who are having to do insurance checks and validation and and all of that stuff. So that was that was where we 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 ended up at the end of all of that. Yes, and how how did you handle it? Like how did you <laughs> make this challenge like a like a oh we did it. <laughs> we ended up having um we ended up having a geographically based spreadsheet for every geographically based wow. region that the insurance yeah. verification specialist would help yeah. us to maintain. Cause part of the problem is when an insurance company, when it changes the coverage that it has for, let's say a hearing aid, they don't send you an email to let you know, like they just do it. And mm-hmm you have no idea about it. And so fortunately our insurance verification specialists were so heavily involved in doing insurance verifications every day. They would find out in a roundabout way when there were updates and they would help us keep those spreadsheets up to date so that, you know, if I am somebody in Alabama, all I need to go and do is is look on my Alabama based, um, you know, insurance spreadsheet, and I can look at all the different insurances and what they cover um, for for hearing aids in my area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my next question will be like, about DI because you know it's really important for learning and development uh, uh, programs and different kinds of projects and did you make something like when you implement learning management system uh, to make this project like more diverse and inclusive for like for your learners for your company like something like that Absolutely. Yeah, we were very mindful of diversity and inclusion. Um, not only did we have employee resource groups uh, for the company, and, and we had a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion um, committee uh, for, mm-hmm. for the company, but um, you know, we are working um, with people who have hearing loss too. And mm-hmm. so, you know, rather than you know just looking at you know the the, the ethnic and, and race and um, gender identity uh, based, you know, diversity and inclusion. We're looking at disability inclusion as well, very heavily. Um, we had a lot of people, I had two different people on my team with hearing impairments and mm-hmm. um, everything that we made had closed captioning, absolutely mm-hmm. everything. Um, visual accessibility was worked mm-hmm. into everything as well. Um, and we were actually part of a global company called Demant that's based in Denmark. And so um, we had a lot of different languages that were mm-hmm. represented too. And so the great thing about Fuse Universal is it had language and translation, AI worked into it so that it could uh, basically create translated transcripts you know, mostly what we used, um, was, was, uh, Spanish. Um, but we ended up getting, um, sort of a reverse, um, 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 solution involved for our customers too, Mm -hmm. because we ended up working with our operations team because we found a lot of customers in our Northeast. We had, um, Russian speaking customers. We had, um, customers who spoke Mandarin. And and so we ended up um, hiring a company that did localized um, um, ASL and language translation based services uh, in all the different pockets that we were in so that if we had somebody coming in who needed um, that from an outside perspective, Mm -hmm. we could have a specialist come in and work with that individual to make sure that we could communicate effectively with them. Um, And then in all of our characters and all of our videos, we made sure that we had, um, you know, all different ethnicities and 
religions represented. Um, you know, when we first came in, we had uh, role play scripts that were Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones. And so we updated that to have Arabic names, to have Spanish names, to have African names, mm -hmm. um, so that we had just a, a much more representative um, group of, of training characters, whether it was beyond or whether it was like in-person characters represented too. Yes, yes, great. <laughs> Thank you for sharing about this point of your project. And maybe in the end of our discussion about your success project with learning management system, like what lessons did you learn from this project and that could be applied to future projects? Maybe your uh, your project right now, which yeah. you like took from your past and used right now. Yeah, I think um, one is definitely involving your stakeholders to a large degree, like especially once again, the folks out in the field, we need to be validating all the time. Is this helpful? Is this accurate? Is this useful? Because that's who we're, we're, we're empowering to do their best work. And then always audit your system. You will be getting, you know, a lot of content over time and to make sure that your learning management system doesn't just become sort of a dumping ground over time for just yes. tons of stuff. It's so important to go through there at least twice a year, I recommend, and look to pull out things that are no longer accurate. Look for things that you can consolidate and look to pull out things completely that just aren't even necessary any anymore. And make sure that you don't have any glaring gaps as well, because too much information can also be a mm -hmm. bad thing when people get caught in overwhelm and analysis paralysis. We need to lead them towards the right things, not mm -hmm. all the things. All, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> It's the same like, you know, in our real life, if you have a lot of information, like a tone, like tone books or something like yeah. that's it. You can just like, okay, this one, no, I don't like it. And time's up. Like t yeah. we don't have t so much time. But if you have just one book or like one, two, it's enough. Yeah. Like, yes, it, it means like it's it's the same, like micro learning is working mm -hmm. like always, right? Yeah. And um, yes, but like, thank so you, good. AI. That's now AI yes. can help us like you know, to, choose, to choose the right information sometimes. But like, uh -huh. you need to use your <clears throat> analyze, like analyze skills because yeah. some of the information is, is not correct and you need to check it. But like right. you have this like correct information and you know that's okay. This point I need to check, it's enough. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, 100%. I use chat GPT a billion times per day sometimes. Yeah, but uh, do you prefer chat GPT or Claude or like another uh, AI assistant? Like I, I love chat GPT and um, we got Copilot. We have Copilot inside of my organization. Yeah. Yeah. and I've tried using it and it's okay for some things. I like the ability to be able to consolidate meeting notes, th things like that. But I guess I got used to being able to copy and paste large pieces of, of text. So let's just mm -hmm. say I'm doing a contract analysis from a vendor yeah. and I need it to summarize the legalese language yeah. for me. I can't put more than 2000 characters in Copilot. It cuts yeah. me off. So I find Absolutely. myself going back to chat GPT for those situations where I need it to analyze a lot of information and, um, you know, just spit something out for me, or if I need it to just rewrite something in a, mm -hmm. in a smoother way. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, you know, um, like in the end of my episode, always I talk to my guests uh, about your, not just about professional life and like something unique from your life experience and outside of your professional life. I know that you spend uh, many years in the fitness industry and yeah. I can see that like fitness is still a big part of your life. And could you share a bit about your relationship with sports? What has sports taught you and how do you bring those lessons into business, team management and learning and development industry? That's a great question. I, I don't think I've ever been asked that question before. Um, 
Yeah, I fit, fitness definitely plays a huge role in my life. It's where I met my husband. Um, wow. My husband and I <laughs> met as as personal trainers back in 2010. Oh, wow. We worked in the same gym. Um, and we had a very similar trajectories. You know, we both were successful. We became fitness managers. We moved up through the ranks in, in fitness. I ended up going, you know, we had both ended up going in, in different um, industries. Uh, eventually, he kept himself more grounded in fitness. But today, we still play a role, um, you know, within the, the, the fitness industry. Um, as far as, you know, lessons, um, I think the biggest lesson that, that you learn in, in fitness is, is that you have to push past moments of pain if you're going to get progress in certain mm-hmm. instances, not in all instances, but it sort of teaches you that level of resilience for dealing with hard things. And a lot of that is mental. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and so I think it, it, it provides a really good lesson, um, professionally and personally that, that when you're going through something that's tough, typically the gains as we call it in fitness are right on the other side of, mm-hmm. of whatever that tough thing is that you're going through and you're going to come out stronger if you mm-hmm. go through, um, you know, the, those challenges. So, um, now at my age, I'm just kind of like, you know, I'm just trying to sh- stay in shape at this point. I'm not trying to do all the crazy stuff I did, I did yes. when I was younger. I'll tell you, it's humbling um, when you have a, a, a kid at the age of 39 and then you you uh, take, a, sit, take some time off and then you get back in the gym and you're sort of comparing yourself to where you were. So these days it's also telling me or, or teaching me patience and mm-hmm. grace with myself and to, 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 to do what you need to do for where you, you are as much as where you want to be. Yes, absolutely. Like in the moment and like, you need <laughs> to feel something like what happened right now with you. And it's, it's the same with me and like every uh, part of my life. And I love, uh, I love gym. Like I think, when I was pregnant after my second son, now he is seven years old. I started to go to the gym and like over seven years, I'm in the gym. And when I was pregnant, my third baby, I was in the gym till the last week before oh, wow. take a birth. Yes. I was in the I gym see. like, yes. And, uh, but I felt so good and I yeah. felt energy. I listened yeah. myself and I was in a moment. If something happened, like, which I felt not so good for me, I stopped it. But right. like, I I felt a lot of energy. And after That's my, great. yes, after my uh, third baby, my recovery was really quicker. simpler. Yes. And quick, nice. quicker. Yeah. Yes. Because, yeah. Like, you know, sport, like, uh, give us... Uh, more energy, like life energy and like vital energy I have from gym. Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah. I wish I had stayed, I wish I had stayed active till longer in my pregnancy. And then um, I didn't, I don't think I got back in the gym for like six months until I was six months postpartum. So it was too much time off, <laughs> but I'm past that now. I'm, okay. I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm nowhere near where I was, yes. but I, I'm, I'm happy with, with where I am today. And at 41, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm not trying to be where I was when I was like, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Like, you know, feel yourself and listen to your heart. It's enough. Like, because yeah. life is right now. It's not something you told, which we want to be, or like, which we yeah. want, want, like, right right now who I am and what I want to do and like I feel myself right now yes it's true and like Renee I know that you were one of the authors of the book Real Talk with Real Fit Pros and could you share the main message you conveyed in the book what were the key points or like themes you confidently wrote or spoke about maybe you could share three key like three key takeaways with our listeners 
Yeah. Um, and, and that's actually one of one, one of three of my books. Um, so I, uh, real talk with real fit pros, um, real talk with real business pros, how to win in a competitive marketplace. That's another one that, that I've written in. And then my solo book is, uh, leading through love, throwing out everything corporate taught you about leadership and management. Yeah. Um, for, for real talk with real fit pros, uh, my chapter was, was on the resign process, um, which basically just means you've been working with a client and um, you are uh, coming up on the end of the three months of, of training sessions that they bought and you're hoping that they'll buy more. That's, that's what we call a re-sign. It's almost like a, it's kind of like contract re-sign. So anybody, if they're, they've been in the fitness industry and they hear re-sign, um, that, that, that's what it means. But it's funny because it can apply to more things. So if you're a consultant, for example, and you work with clients, um, a lot of the, the core principles can, can apply to that. Um, I think that the, the biggest part is that you need to draw a clear plan of how you're going to help that person achieve their goal. So first, the goal needs to be clear. The goal or the goals need to be very clear. That person needs to own those goals. They need to be very bought in. It's, it's, it's not your goal for them and it's their goal for themselves. They're very bought into it. And then it just becomes a part of the conversation over and over again. So mm-hmm. if you've got a contract and you're working together for three months, every week or so, you need to reassess where you guys are in terms of where you want to be. So that if they get to that very last session, they're fully aware that like, hey, we've got six months more to go. And it's been part of the conversation the whole time. You're not just all of a sudden saying, hey, are you going to? Are you going to continue working with me? Are you going to sign up another contract? Like, no, we already know that because we're one third of the way away from your goal, we need to keep working together. So um, that that's really what's at the basis of the the, the chapter that I wrote in, in that book. Um, and when thinking about it that way, I think it can can apply for anybody who's working on you know contract based um, yeah. work out there. So for any of our consultants. Um, maybe, maybe there's a, a little snippet in there that, that might be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for sharing. And you mentioned that you're a mom of amazing daughter. Yeah. And I know that she's 20 months, right? Yeah. And what do you love to do with her? And you really love. <laughs> and maybe it was, you know, unexpected for you, like before you took a birth. Like yeah. maybe it was something like really unexpected for you, like a mom. Yeah, you know, well, if, if we're talking about unexpected as a mom, um, so I thought that like I was going to go through the same sleep training process that that everybody hears about out there. Like, <laughs> okay, you know, they, they got to sleep in your room until they're at least six months old. And then, you know, you're going to do cry it out or Ferber method or one of those things. And then they're just going to magically like sleep in their own crib in their own bedroom <laughs> And yes. you no, know, we did not, but like we tried, we, yeah. we got there. And then, <laughs> um, I think the first time we tried to put her down in her crib by herself, she just flipped out. And, you know, ever since she's, she's been over a year old, um, she's, she's been having more trouble sleeping, which is the opposite of, of what you hear. And so, after she she turned 12 months, it became really apparent to me, like, hey, if I'm going to be able to be good at my job, yes. <laughs> like <laughs> deliver what I need to, I need to get sleep and she needs to get sleep. And so we started co-sleeping around that time. And um, I'll say that I love it. And if she wants to co-sleep and give me um, cuddles until she's 18 years old and moves out, I'll, I'll take it because she's my one and only, you know, mm-hmm. um, it, it was really hard for us to get to the point where we had her mm-hmm. because we did have her later in life. Um, she's the product of three failed IVF cycles. She magically uh, happened in a converted IUI from a failed, mm-hmm. my last failed IV, IVF cycle. So she's a miracle baby already. 
Um, but I'm never going to get this time back with her. Mm. I'm never going to get it back. And when I look, um, you know, 20 years from now, I'm not going to regret having more sweet snuggles with my daughter Mm. versus, Oh, she's, you know, she slept in her crib in her room by herself. I I thought I was going to be really rigid on that and I'm not. And I actually really love getting to snuggle with her every night. It's, It's sweet and it's special. And anytime she's not asleep, she won't snuggle. She, she, she will not stand still for a second. So if I want to get any snuggles at all, they have to be while she's sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's, it's a brilliant story. And like the same for me, like my, my, like first and second sons, they slept in the crib and like separate, like, yes, but they was ready. But my third one, he's, he's not ready. And like, yes, yeah. sometimes at night, like he came, I, I heard, okay, he's on the way, <laughs> like with okay, his pillow yeah. and like with his cover and like, yes, <laughs> mommy, I want to sleep with you and dad. Aww. And like, <laughs> I I, I heard him and like yes it's so it's so cute and uh, I love it and like yes it's it's great yes and so fast so fast it's like just small period in our life when they can do that Mm -hmm. and like that's it yeah and after that it's a new new period like new new era for our babies when they because yes they grow up so fast it's true right before I know it I'll be embarrassing to her so during the time when when I'm her everything I'll you know I'll let that be yes (laughs) uh yes and like you know uh, Rene it's like interesting question because you was in a fitness uh many years and it's it's question about maybe fitness and like healthy or no unhealthy maybe what's your favorite food and why (laughs) maybe fitness will help you to find your favorite food (laughs) or maybe no like yes um i have been on a burger (laughs) trip Ah, like so fitness food. I'm mostly plant based. I'm mostly plant based. Oh, so for really? Me, those are Beyond Burgers. Um, yeah. I love a good Beyond Burger. I swear that the pickle makes the burger too. Yes. So if you want to have a super fancy burger, you got it. You can't just use the like Mount Olive, like yeah. floppy little jar pickles. You got to get like the really good. Like I think it, they're called Grillo's pickles, mm-hmm. and they're expensive. But they will make your burger so much better. So (laughs) I I say a really good Beyond Burger with a good pickle. And I love tater tots. I'll always do tater tots Ah. on the side. But that's why why I work out. I work out because I love to eat. Uh, (laughs) Yes, you know, I have uh, my best friend. And one day we we were a runner with her. And we did uh, two marathons together. Oh, wow. And yes, and she told me one day that she is running for for the food. (laughs) Because she she has to run because she loves food. And if she stops run, she starts to be like, not so healthy. (laughs) I told her, yeah, I got it. (laughs) exactly it's that accountability process if you want the good stuff you gotta you gotta work for it yes absolutely and you know in the end of my podcast i have three questions and it's the same question for all the guests like because you know i have different questions but these three like the same first first of that uh what was the last thing you asked chat gpt or copilot or i don't know (laughs) the last thing i asked chat gpt as i pull it up here is (laughs) so um in in uh in in what i do um i also do internal communications so i didn't i didn't mention that i leave the internal communications department as well as the learning development department Um, and so the last thing I asked it to do is I was editing some speaking notes for someone. And this is someone who tends to have a lot of self-reference, a lot Mm -hmm. of reference to themselves. So I said, Hey, chat GPT, can you help me reduce the amount of self-referencing in these speaking notes? Uh. (laughs) (laughs) The person will be unnamed. (laughs) 
That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, tell your favorite quatrain or lyrics and explain why exactly you choose it and you love it. So my favorite lyrics, it's really hard not to have um, um, favorite favorite lyrics right now from um, any of my the songs my daughter loves, because I'm telling you, like, Wheels on the Bus and all of that stuff is what gets stuck in my head. Um, so one of my favorite songs is I love Ed Sheeran, by the way. Ed Sheeran's just my favorite. And one of my favorite songs that he has is uh, called Beautiful People. And um, the lyrics are, uh, I'm trying to find the refrain right here. Yeah, so that's not who we are. We're not beautiful people. We're not beautiful people. Um, we don't fit in well. We are just ourselves. I could use some help getting out of this conversation. So the oh. whole song is about how they're in conversation with like yeah. these flashy LA people who are talking about how much money they have and who they yes. know and everything. And like him and I guess maybe it was uh, his current wife at the time are just like, they're just like, we're just us. Like, yes, we're not flashy. We're just who we are. We're nothing special like how do we get out of this conversation yes I love it because my husband and I were like you know if we go out to dinner we're wearing sweats and stuff. <laughs> we're not yes. fancy people <laughs> and so it just really rings true to, to to who I am at the end of the day which is I just I am who I am and um you know I don't I don't have a lot of a lot of pretense and I just really appreciate you know no matter how no matter what style somebody has or when people show up as themselves as their authentic selves my authentic self unfortunately still wears fitness clothes because from the fitness industry you get spoiled and not being that that comfortable but I just really appreciate when people are unapologetically themselves and mm -hmm. um I encourage everybody on my team and everybody who I work with to just show up as who they are every single day, not who they think people will be impressed by. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Thank you for sharing. And, uh, you know, in the end, I have a special question. Um, it's called ask the next guest on my podcast. It's here's how it goes. Every guest get to through a question at the next guest. And um, uh, like my pre previous guest was Alison Sedler. Uh, she, she was my wonderful guest and she passed uh, on her question to you. <laughs> Are you ready to answer? I'm ready. This is cool. <laughs> I've never seen this, this element in a podcast before. This is a really clever one. Yeah, yes, yes, it's true. And she asked you, would you put a neural link chip in your brain? That's a quick no for me <laughs> because it would involve some type of brain surgery and that terrifies the living daylights out of me. Yeah, no, that's a quick no. <laughs> uh, thank you, Renee. Like when we talked to her last last time uh, in my last episode, I, I told her the same. No, I love technology, but no right now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, I told the same. Okay, and now it's your time to ask the question for my next guest. And okay, I will ask so my next guest. This is sort of another hot topic along the lines of technology. So I would like to know from your next guest: Do they think that AI is headed towards making our world better, or? Terminator style, do they believe that it's heading towards uh, an apocalyptic evil AI future? Yes. Is AI going to be helpful or evil? evil. What, is, what do you yeah. think it's going to be? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Rene. And you know, we've done for today. And Rene, thank you so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed talking with you and I would be thrilled to meet you in person. So you are always welcome to sunny Florida in Fort Lauderdale and a big thank you to all 
our podcast listeners. I'm looking forward to the upcoming episodes with my future guests. Yes, thank you, Rene. Thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you, Tamara. I, I love the podcast. I Speaking of um, authentic selves, I love your authentic self. It's so cool. I've never seen anybody with your style before. I love it. It's awesome. Thank you. Um, and... Um, I uh, I only hope I can get to Florida soon. We yes, well, my daughter was born, and I'm yes. for 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 some some sun and sand. Yes, and welcome with your family, with your husband, and your sweetest girl. Like always, you are welcome. Yes, <laughs> yes, and and I and until we meet again, like take care, stay curious, and continue shining brightly. <laughs> Thank you for this episode yes really